So uh, this lesson is going to be about marriage, and we're going to look at it from a covenant perspective. There's lots of different ways to look at marriage, uh, the relationship between the people and how you make that stronger and things like that. But we're going to look at it from a covenant perspective, which is really from God's perspective, because it's a covenant that God created for people to take advantage of. So we start by asking, what is marriage? And of course, as I said, we're talking about a God marriage, and we'll be talking about civil marriages a little bit later on here. And so a marriage is a covenant that was created by a covenant creating God. That's the kind of God that God is. He loves covenants. He makes covenants. Um, and, and we know some of those covenants. We know the new covenant that Jesus uh, created, the old covenant, the Old Testament covenant, and covenants with David and other people God made. And that's just the way God is. He, he likes to make covenants where he offers things and promises things. And then there are things that we have to do to uh, keep in that covenant. And that's the kind of things we're going to be looking at today. So like all covenants, the marriage covenant has clauses that control who can enter it. And so not just anybody can come into this covenant. You have to meet the requirements. And that's just like a legal covenant. Uh, you have to meet requirements before the covenant is in effect. And, and so the covenant would go into effect when people want to enter it and uh, they, they meet the requirements to enter it. And so, uh, and like other uh, covenants, it offers benefits. You, you don't go into a covenant for no benefit to yourself. There's something in it for you. And, and so all parties in a, in a covenant have something that they're getting out of it. Um, and they, they want it to, to be in existence. And it also has terms uh, that are binding on the parties, things that the parties are supposed to do. And then sometimes breaking those terms will break the covenant and make it come to an end. So that's just kind of typical, typical covenant stuff. And, and as I mentioned before, the new covenant that Jesus set up is also a covenant, obviously. Um, and so an individual enters that covenant by faith. And so you, you receive the promises of that covenant by entering into it by faith. And, and so the benefits in that covenant are, are quite a few. There's the Holy Spirit, salvation, uh, blessings in this life, all sorts of other things are, are part of the benefits that come from the, that covenant, the new covenant that Jesus set up. And, uh, and there's requirements in that one. Uh, you, you need to avoid sin and you must not sin intentionally. Uh, and then we talked about that actually just recently. So um, the new covenant is a covenant. And so it's similar in those ways that it has those kinds of requirements to it. So the marriage covenant in particular, now there may be more things than I've thought up here, but I, these are the ones that I could think of. So it has entry requirements. And, and so certain things have to be in place before you can enter into a marriage covenant, the God marriage covenant, not the uh, civilian one. So you must believe that there is a covenant to enter. And so that's kind of the basic first thing. You, you need to accept the idea that there is this covenant. And because this is a covenant that God created, that really means you need to believe in God. That's kind of essential to being in a marriage covenant. Um, if you don't believe the covenant exists or God exists, then you can't believe the covenant exists. And you, you couldn't possibly accept the idea that you were entering into it. So that one seems kind of obvious. Also, um, like any other covenant, you need to have the mental faculties to understand the terms of the covenant and what you're supposed to do and those sort of things. And that's not really a big thing for most people. You need to be valid partners. And, and the Bible talks about people who are invalid for being married, um, brothers, sisters, um, close relatives, those sorts of things. The Bible talks about those people you, you aren't allowed to have a marriage covenant with. And so you, you couldn't enter into this covenant um, being a, a sister or a brother. And uh, there was a, a, a big uproar about Woody Allen. You heard of him, right? The director. Uh, he married his stepdaughter. And, uh, and then I come to find out, I think yesterday, that Elon Musk's father, he remarried because his wife died, I think it was. But then he married his, his um, stepdaughter. Mm -hmm. Well, he didn't really marry her, but he's living with her and they've had children you know, things like that. And she's like 30, 40 years younger. Yeah. So I don't think there's anything in the Bible about that, or, or unless I'm, I'm mistaken, but that, that's obviously common sense that that's not right. You know, I think it would fall under the jurisdiction of, of, of children, you know, your, your own children. Yeah. If you adopted them, then it's, whether they, they are your own flesh or not, yeah, I think it still holds the same way. Yeah, yeah, and it's kind of just awkward. <laughs> okay, and so also, um, and we know this one well, um, um, the marriage covenant that God set up uh, requires one man and one woman. And of course, God is the third person in that covenant. He's always involved in his covenants. 
and and um, and the Bible makes that clear in lots of places. But there are lots of people who want to believe it's otherwise, and they they insist that um, God just didn't say it was okay for a man to marry a man, but He really intended it. Um, and so that sort of thing goes on. So um, another thing, puberty is kind of necessary for it to be a meaningful marriage covenant because of the benefits for that. One of the benefits for that is a sexual relationship. And, and if you are a, a person still in puberty, that really wouldn't make any sense. So um, the, the other benefits are a special closeness between two people that is unlike anything, unlike even a brother and a, a, and a close relative relationship. It's a, it's a new special closeness that's possible. And, and I imagine you have the same experience that I have there is that um, I tell things to Melody that I wouldn't tell to anybody else uh, about me. And, and so there's that trust level there that, that just doesn't exist in other relationships. Even a brother or a sister, you wouldn't uh, reveal some things to. And, and uh, so that's the kind of closeness that a marriage covenant makes uh, possible. You, you have a closeness that is just not like anything else. And also uh, a benefit of it, if you take advantage of it, is that you can work as a team. And that's really especially useful for parenting, but not just for parenting. You can actually, um, as a team, if one person is sick or something like that, the other person can fill in for them and jump in and help and do that sort of thing. So that, that value of being a team in a marriage covenant uh, comes with this too. And I mentioned the sexual relationship, that's part of it as well. And, and along with that, the marriage covenant produces the best environment for raising children. It gives you a father, a good loving father. It gives you a, a good loving wife who are both God believing people. And so that's your, your good foundation for raising children. And the obligations under this co covenant, there are things you, you need to do. And, and one of them is God says that the, the man is the head of the family. And he says that love uh, one another is one of the obligations. Paul spends some time talking about that, how uh, we should love one another in a relationship and how we essentially own each other in a relationship. And the uh, duration or exit of a covenant, um, normally the covenant only ends with death of either person, but it can also end with adultery. And, and that's, uh, we'll spend a little bit of time later on talking about that. So normally, uh, it's only by death of a person. That's the, the only way that God finds acceptable. Any questions on that? Okay. So summarizing some of those points there. Um, what that is really saying is that a marriage is not available to unbelievers. And, and um, although they like to think that they are in a marriage, uh, it's not one that God accepts. It, it might be one acceptable in their civil society, but um, God wouldn't accept uh, unbelievers in the marriage covenant. And so the result of that is all of their relationships that they think they have with their husband or spouse or wife, um, nothing that they do uh, pleases God. And their, their whole relationship is just one adultery as far as God sees it. Another thing there is that marriage is not available under broader terms. People trying to expand that marriage covenant. I mentioned before, allowing same gender, things like that, um, that, that people want to find a way to squeeze into a marriage. And, and there are even some churches who will marry people who just simply don't, uh, aren't, it wouldn't be a marriage under God's covenant. Um, and there's, there's, we talked about the exiting the covenant. There's only one way to exit the covenant that's acceptable to God. And that's the death of one of the people. Every other way involves adultery. And there is no divorce or remarriage. Um, we'll talk about that some more later on here. We'll just kind of touch on it here. But, but one thing that comes from Matthew 9, 6 is that the things, therefore, that God has united, let not a man separate. So men have no business in this. And it also supports the idea that, that God is the one who unites these people in this covenant. It, it isn't them themselves. It isn't a marriage isn't between two people, it's between three, the two people and God. And, and uh, in society, civil society, they tend to think of a marriage being just two people, but that's not the way it should be. So um, we talked about um, leave exiting by adultery. If one uh, spouse intentionally commits adultery, that breaks the covenant. Um, but can you know if it's intentional? And this is the situation you get into. I don't think we'll deal with it this week, but there may be a, a same topic lesson next week where we'll get into those kind of things. Um, but um, sometimes only God knows for sure, and you don't know if it was intentional or not, or just what happened there. Um, and so God wants us to show the same kind of forgiveness that he showed Israel. And so Israel was always his example of, of a marriage and a defective marriage. And, and, uh, and he uh, forgave them multiple times over and over again. 
So God wants us to show that kind of forgiveness when we can. But of course, if the other spouse has simply decided that extramarital affairs should just be part of his life and, and we should accept that idea, that's he's just not under the covenant. That's not acceptable. That's uh, completely outside. So I mentioned how head of the household. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about that. Um, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, this is made clear quite a few times. And I have some verses in the next slide that will show that. And so, but the number of the people in the church who reject this is really a measure of how modernist, modernism and modernist thinking has, has crept into the church. There are people who don't want to accept that idea, uh, despite the fact that it's in the Bible so many times. So, and, and they'd like to, to think of it as a punishment, um, that, that this idea that the head of the household was something done to punish the woman, but that isn't the case. God didn't do it that for that reason. He was doing it because he knows the natures of his creation and he knows how a marriage and a family are going to work best. And he says it'll work best if the man is the head of the household. And uh, it's not for any animus reason. It's just simply that's, that's how things work best. And, and there's some logic behind it too. Uh, if you have just two people uh, together, they can deadlock on a decision. And so how do you make a decision in that case? And, and um, God's plan is that the man would be the one who would break the deadlock and, and make the decision when, there, when it was impossible any other way to make a decision. And, and that fits into our judicial system quite well. You don't go to a court and expect to have two judges for the same reason, because they might be a split decision and they wouldn't come to a decision. So there's always only one judge in the courtroom. If, if there's a tribunal where they put together multiple judges or multiple people who are doing a judgment, you always do that in threes or maybe sometimes fives or sevens. And the Supreme Court has nine justices for that same reason, always odd numbers because you won't have a, a deadlock situation. So it just makes kind of sense to do it that way. Whenever you have two, you need to have some way of breaking that. And God has said that the head of the household is the man who will do that. So a couple of verses on that topic. The first one comes Genesis 2.24. And this is immediately after the creation of Eve and, and after God has brought Eve to man. And it says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And not many people understand part of that. Uh, a lot of them kind of read it as blah, 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 be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And they don't understand why it's talking about leaving his father and his mother and why it says only the man is leaving his father and mother. Why doesn't it say that the woman is also leaving her father and mother? And uh, so, but there is a reason for that. And the point is that the, the man's situation is changing. He's going from being a member of a household where he's not in charge and going to be uh, the head of a household now. And so that change in the status is happening with him. So the next verse says, uh, and this is um, after the sin by Adam and Eve. Genesis 3.16 says, Yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And then skipping into the New Testament to make sure we get a New Testament verse there, it says, But I want you to know, this is from 1 Corinthians 3.11, But I want you to know that the head of every man is the Messiah, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of the Messiah is God. So what he sets up there in an awkwardly structured uh, sentence, I would say, is there's a hierarchy of things. God is at the top, Messiah is next, then the man, then the woman. And that's um, the point that he's making is pretty much everybody has somebody who is in charge of them. And I never, I, I always thought men and a woman. Yeah. But it just says a man. It does. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 And a lot of people gloss over things like that. That's, I, I keep saying this over and over. Ask questions like that. Say, why does it only say man here? Does, does it mean man and woman? Sometimes it does. Or does it just mean the man here? And, and there's often good information to be dug out if you can uh, ask those questions and, and look for the right answers for them. But, but the whole. The whole uh, model goes out the window if the man is not subjected to Christ. Oh, yes. Yeah, well, that's what we're talking about. That's not a marriage anymore. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it, it just turns out a mess. Uh, and I, I've seen plenty of young, uh, young women that, that I've seen will marry a guy that is not Christ-like. He's not, you know, a believer. And she says, I'll fix him, you know, I'll change him. Yeah. And, and, and then he, he feels like, Okay, she's not going to push me around and tell me what to do. 
I'm the head of the house. About the only thing that they seem to remember in the Bible is that they're the head of the house and whatever they say goes. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't so the point. That. <laughs> yes, definitely. Is that 311 the correct? Is it not? Did I mess up that quote? Mine says, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which they Okay, I, I've messed that one up. I'll have to look it up again. Yeah. Um, maybe three nineteen. No, no, that's not it. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll have to get that one straightened out. Uh, that's definitely not right then. But it's in the Bible. <laughs> okay. Um, any more comments on that slide? Move on. Okay. So beginning of marriage, um, a marriage begins when a man and a woman agree to the terms of the covenant. And, and there isn't any need for anybody else in that. Um, there's, the Bible never says you need to have a priest or a preacher or a justice of the peace or a sea captain who can marry people or anything like that. Um, <laughs> sea captains could do that, apparently. <laughs> they, have, they have that power. Um, and, and so uh, none of those things are, are necessary uh, to begin a marriage. Uh, a marriage begins when the two people can meet those uh, covenant requirements and, and do want to. And, and so, um, and you don't need a church or a ceremony either. Um, Adam and Eve didn't have a church or a ceremony, and there are lots of other things like that. Um, Abraham, um, when it was his wives back then, they didn't have ceremonies or anything like that. They just sort of made an agreement, and, and that was the way it was. It was you were now married, and, and that's really all that's required. And many in, in the church don't understand this. They think that somehow the pastor, pastor has some magical power to uh, marry two people together. Um, but he, he doesn't. And this, this idea actually comes from Catholicism. One of the things that Catholicism needed to do early on was what's called arrogating powers, um, bringing into existence powers to themselves. And, and, um, and so that would give them a reason to exist. And so the Catholic Church uh, built up a lot of things that it, it believes you can't do those things without the Catholic Church. And so they, that kind of makes them the center point of, of life. And so one of those things was marriage. And they believe that you can't be married um, a God marriage unless you do it in a Catholic church. And, and similarly with salvation, they believe that you can't be saved without the church. Uh, and uh, so that and some other things like that, um, the Catholic church has said we have these powers and, and therefore that affirms their need to exist. But that isn't correct. So um, even unbelievers though want to attach the, the church to their marriage. Um, there are lots of unbelievers who want to have a church marriage. Mm -hmm. The verse you were talking about, 1 Corinthians 11, Three. Dyslexia. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I think it's a three eleven, right? Yeah. yeah I've, I've done that before. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Yeah. Yeah, that one says Christ. My translation says Messiah. Same thing. Eleven three. All right, that's good. Thanks for that. Okay, so um so as I was saying, unbelievers like to have their uh, a church wedding, even though they aren't believers. And there are some churches who will do that. Um, a lot of churches, though, say, well, you really need to attend and be a member and things like that before we have any business marrying you. Now there are governments who also marry people and have their hands in that business as though they, they have somehow had an ability to marry people. Well, the women, they have the mayor. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like, like they don't have enough going on. It's not, you know. And so, like you said, here comes the government can into your business, into your marriage, into mm -hmm. your household. Yeah. Yeah, we have justices of peace and things like that, um, other ways to be married other than church uh, marriages. But there's still a lot of unbelievers want to get a church marriage. Um, but the church can play an important role in, in starting a marriage, uh, and, and it is important really to teach the people what the terms of the covenant are, what God expects them to do within the marriage, what the marriage is supposed to be, and, and, and also to counsel them and prepare them for that. Um, marriage is a big change in your life. You change your thinking from being an individual to being a team, and that's a big change in your whole focus in life. And so the, the church has a big role that it should be playing there. And, and uh, it, although it can't marry them, it, it can certainly help them 
um, begin the marriage and uh, if they have problems in the marriage can help them to continue on in the marriage. And also the congregation and the community and the family all have an important role too. It's, it's very good and, and the Bible even talks about this, um, the value of, have, of have receiving a blessing from those who are your, your family and neighbors. And, and not just that they know that you're married, but also that they feel good about this, this marriage. And, and so involving them in the marriage is, is a good thing, even biblically. And so, and, and one of those things that kind of comes out of that is the necessity to ensure that the marriage is public and, and that um, you aren't hiding this marriage and just living a lie. And there's a place in the Bible where that actually happens, where a man claims not to be married when he is married, and that just ends up with trouble. So, um, and so a public ceremony is uh, a common thing, and that helps uh, to make it a public uh, pr proclamation that we are now a married couple. And, and so a ring and other culturally accepted signs often go along with that to help it uh, make clear, it clear that you're a married person. And different societies do that in different ways. Uh, and so it's also necessary for the Christian to obey the laws of the land. There may be some laws uh, about marriage that you have to uh, follow, um, but almost always the God's laws are more restrictive than the laws of the land, so that isn't usually a big problem. Um, but there, there certainly were times when, the, when society felt the need to test people to make sure that they weren't brothers and sisters and things like that that were married. I don't think any of that happens in, in our country anymore. I remember when Joe and I, we went to go get our marriage license, and that, I think you have to do that a week or two before the wedding. We went for a blood test. Mm -hmm. Old days, yeah. Yeah. Hey, there were no days. <laughs> and we weren't related anymore. Yeah. Why? And we weren't related. Why? <laughs> <laughs> were to make sure that I think you weren't related. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I saw that because uh, they'll find out the, if the blood uh, will be. And also, I think to, for some certain Pills? diseases, because way back when they didn't have DNA tests, they didn't, they couldn't have told if you were related to humans. I think it was more for to make sure you didn't have certain blood-borne diseases, hepatitis, or stuff like that. Yeah. But yeah, you don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's gone now. And this um, right here, this slide that we're we were concentrating on, this you know, act, goes out the door, like you said before. If they are both unbelievers, or even if there's one unbeliever, because yeah. then you're coming or you know, just simply said, if you are a true believer and you marry a Catholic, <laughs> right? Like, how does that work? Yeah. Like, what uh, you're celebrating Christmas and Easter and Halloween, I was pagan, mm -hmm. and you're trying to do, even if you're the man, you're trying to do the right thing, but she's going to get you. You know, she, you're going to have problems, and you're going to go back and forth, and the kids, how are they going to be raised, and don't send them to my mom, send them to my yeah. The whole thing can explode if there is one unbeliever, one people. Yeah, yeah, it, it makes a big difference. Um, I had uh, my business partner um, uh, was a not an unbeliever in anything, but he wanted to marry this woman who was a Roman Catholic. And so they had to go to the Catholic Church and talk this over and figure out how to do it. And, he, and so he had to attend the Catholic Church for a length of time and make some kind of declarations and sign some stuff. And then it was okay. <laughs> so he signed his soul, you know. Yeah, whatever he did. Away his soul, yeah. but, but he remained an unbeliever and she was uh, an infrequent Catholic. But, but there are exceptions to every rule, though. I mean, sometimes you can have two believers get married. In fact, I, 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 the latest figures I have heard two believers getting married, or rather Christian marriages, has been more than 50% divorce rate. Yeah, yeah. And that shouldn't be. It shouldn't be that way, but that's what, what's going on, you know. But that's because of the doctrines in the churches now. Yes, it is. That's because the compromise, compromise is the poison that infected the church, mm -hmm. period. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And then I remember when that happened. I grew up through that period of time. It was kind of in the 70s when that was happening. And, and all of society was starting to get marriages or getting divorces. And until that time, even in society's law, divorces were a really difficult thing to get, if at all. And, and uh, the, the laws for society changed. And almost immediately, the people in the church said, hey, I want a divorce too. And they started bringing in those ideas from society that weren't godly ideas. And the churches would, wouldn't fight against it or didn't fight against it. And men, not knowing how to raise their kids, their, men, their little boys, mm -hmm. that you are the head of the household. And this is what it means to be a godly man, to be a good man, to be a Jesus follower, mm -hmm. and true faith, a true believer, and then bring your family in. You know, that's not fair anymore. No, 
No, it is sad. Yeah. But there is a, a place for the church in that regard because when I was growing up and I was in my early teens, and we started going to church. Uh, my dad was not a church goer at all. You know, he was not religious at all. He was very worldly. But thank God that there was a, a, a man who was a deacon in the church. He stepped up and he took me under his wing. He showed me how to read the Bible. He told me how to pray. Uh, he gave me some very basic advice, you know. <laughs> he even gave me something very practical that I'm still laughing about now. There was a girl that was very interested in me back then. And she was a really attractive, nice little, a nice girl. But he says, he says, Joe, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to warn you something. Nobody will ever tell you this but me because I'm your counselor. He says, go look at mom. Her mom. And that's what she's going to be like when she gets older. Well, I'm not, that's not my idea. By the way, it wasn't really good. It was, it but that lady was <laughs> Oh, I see. <laughs> And I don't, I mean, I still want to remain friends with her, but I don't think it was, yeah, it kind of cool things. <laughs> yeah, you know. well, and now but churches have found the, that's watching the physical, but what about the spiritual? You yeah, know, you can, you can have Mary that you know, that. We all go by appearance, but sometimes we yeah, that's yeah, true. absolutely. That also can deceive us too. Yeah. You know? yeah. If you only marry somebody that's attractive, I mean, who knows what's inside of them too? You know. And the church now finds itself in a problem uh, because they haven't been teaching what marriage is about, mm -hmm. and so what pastor would now dare day, dare say that um, your divorce was invalid um, when half his congregation is divorced? Um, and, and so that becomes a tough thing to sell. And, and so it just doesn't get talked about. Wasn't it the, the Adventist church that laid down the law one time? I, or one of those churches, I forget what it was. I'm going to say Adventist. And they said, oh, if you were divorced, you need to, I mean, and remarry, you need to divorce that lady and go back to the original or something. <laughs> that, that that's not, a mess. Yeah, that's not what the Bible says <laughs> either. <laughs> <laughs> if, yeah, it's contrary to Bible. You, she's right about that. It says if you ever, if you divorce a woman and you go back to your first wife, it's yeah, you can't. I yeah. forgot exactly what term they used, but it was not not godly. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah and uh, so the the church has been failing for so long that they're in a problem now in that area. Okay, now here's a. a a topic you've probably never thought of, um, failing to enter the marriage covenant. And this is people who think that they were married, but because they didn't meet the requirements, they never were successfully married. And, and my backup for this is um, from Leviticus in one of the sacrifices that God talks about. Um, he provides the term for a particular kind of sacrifice, and in this sacrifice, a person eats part of it. And, and so God says that with this sacrifice, you can eat it on the first day, the, the day of the sacrifice. You can eat it on the second day, but not on the third day. Um, after that, on the third day, it has to be burned if there's anything left over from this sacrifice. And, and so then God says, if anyone eats it on the third day, then the whole sacrifice is rejected all the way back right to the start. And that's kind of an interesting thing. What it means is if the person eats it on the third day, then the sacrifice, which actually occurred at least two days later, was not acceptable even then. And that's because when it was sacrificed, God knew what was going to happen. Remember always that God knows the future. And, and so it wasn't an acceptable sacrifice at the time it was sacrificed because God knew the guy was going to eat it on the third day and make it an invalid sacrifice. And, and I, I see furrowed eyebrows. <laughs> um, and, and we always need to keep God's perspective on things, uh, knowing that he knows the future. And, and uh, we often forget about it and think of things only in our time-based sense of, of reality. But it isn't that way for God. And so you can be in a situ situation where you... You started out doing the right things, but then you did the wrong thing and you wrecked everything right from the beginning. And, and, and that's um, the same way with uh, the marriage covenant. You could be in that same situation there. And so what happened was, God, um, from God's perspective, God knew the person in his heart and what he was going to do when he made that sacrifice. And so God, from the start, said, no, that's not an acceptable sacrifice because I know what you're going to do. And, and so therefore, God rejected the sacrifice at the time it was made based on his knowledge of the future. 
I know this is complicated. Time is complicated. Um, for us, though, who live in a time-based world and we think in, in terms of uh, things happening and causality and those sort of things all, all being in a row, um, uh, the message is different to us. And it, and it really is don't enter into covenants when you plan to be careless with the terms of the covenant or even expect to violate the terms. And that goes along with we've uh, recently talked about vows a little bit. Uh, and, and God says, don't make a vow if you aren't planning to uh, uh, keep that vow, uh, because God is also a God who makes vows and, and um, he keeps his vows and he expects the same thing from us. So uh, remember always that God knows what you will do and, and the covenant may not be accepted at the time you think you've created it. And that leaves you thinking that you are in this covenant or you did this good thing, but God rejected it from the start because he knew you were going to do it wrong. And so this, this does apply to marriage. Um, a, a marriage covenant can be rejected by God for the same reason. One or the other person will violate the terms and, and uh, God knows that in advance. And so this, um, include, it also, well, let me say it first, it includes people who agree to the terms at the start but change their minds in the future. And that's what we were just kind of talking about, it, is this idea that someone can go into the marriage saying, yeah, I'm going to stay with this marriage right through to the end. And then uh, a year in, they say, yeah, I don't think it's not working for me and, and changes his mind and, and breaks it. And, and so from God's perspective, that marriage never existed. There was never a point when that marriage existed because he knew that this person was going to change his mind and, and break the covenant. That's not something we can tell. No, that's exactly right. We can't tell that. And, and so um, from, from our perspective, we, we just need to remember that. God takes these covenants seriously uh, and that uh, we need to go into it with the intent to follow through with what we have said we're going to do. But yeah, we can't tell that. Um, and, and so uh, therefore the, the spouses may believe they have a God approved marriage when they don't. And, and we can't tell that, uh, you don't know that. But in fact, uh, what's going on is that every day of their life is just another day of adultery going on. There was something that, um, that really got me turned off from Apple, um, among other things, of course. And, and when uh, the new guy, I, I forgot what his name is now, the, the guy that took over Steve Jobs, uh, he came out that he was... Tim Cook. Yeah, Tim Cook, yeah. And, and he said, I thank God he made me gay. He said, because he brought me to my partner. He's the one that brought me to him. And where, where yeah. in the world did he get that? And from now, henceforth, the the um, he said from this point forward, all the rainbow stuff that we have in our Apple logos, mm -hmm. it's going to going to symbolize homosexuality and lesbian marriages. I thought, okay, where's the exit? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's amazing what people will do like that. Um, yeah. They'll just proclaim it to be something God approved. Yeah, and he said it was God's thing that he, he made yeah. it come together and all of that. Yeah. And it's so crazy it is that in their twisted minds, in their twisted souls, they are still looking for God's approval. Mm -hmm. They want it. They need it. Yeah. They, they, they're like, we want a real marriage so to work it, but we're going to go have a church ceremony. <laughs> and it's like, you're so twisted, but you're still looking for him. What? You're truly really like gone, like you're just crazy. Yeah, yeah, but that does show that the core of every person is like that. There is that hunger for God, that, that desire there. That father approved. Yeah, but then they want to twist it around and make what they're doing acceptable. <laughs> they want you to believe that God bends to humans. Mm -hmm. That's what they want. Yeah. I'm telling you right now, God has bent to my will and has blessed this gay marriage. <laughs> and that's basically what that yes. guy's saying. Because um, he's stating as a fact. Mm -hmm. Hey, don't worry. God has accepted this. Yeah. He's bent to my will. And all these other things going on, people think God bends to your will. Mm -hmm. That's just the opposite of what happens. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. there's another side to that, and that is that <laughs> it's more about their conscience as well, mm -hmm. saying, I'm not doing anything wrong. Yeah. I'm okay. Yeah, that's true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and if God is in, in on it, then I'm okay. But you can justify anything. I had to kill that guy because that guy was, <laughs> you know, he said some bad things about God, and I think let him have it, and God led me to it. You can justify anything if you want to. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you do. And then we live in a time where it's amazing when people will claim all sorts of things that are just bizarre. Um, anyway, we won't go get lost on that topic. <laughs> so, 
Um, so now we're talking about something even more different, multiple marriages, because that shows up in the Old Testament. <clears throat> and how does that fit into God's marriage? So, and this is something that's hard for modern Christians to accept. Um, a man can be in multiple marriage covenants. Um, and this was practiced in the Old Testament times. There's lots of evidence for that. And God found no fault in it, uh, none at all. In fact, uh, there's one place where he talks to David and he says, if you had wanted more wives, I would have given you more wives. Um, so why did you go and take this wife or this woman who wasn't your wife? And, and you remember the whole story there, the Bathsheba story. And, and so uh, God never found any fault in those multiple marriages. Uh, that was completely acceptable. And the only thing he really said about it is don't have too many of those. And then Solomon went and had like a billion of them. And, and um, so um, that's all that really the Old Testament says about that. And there's never a change in the Old Testament where it says, well, from now on, you can only have a single marriage. Um, and, and although that's the law now, and we wouldn't do otherwise. Um, and so um, these re relationships were multiple marriages. They weren't threesomes or foursomes. Uh, it's important to think of it that way because there are some people who misunderstand what a multiple marriage uh, was at that time. And so it was, it was multiple individual marriage, and a man having more than one marriage. But a woman couldn't have multiple marriages. The Bible doesn't explicitly say that, but it, it is um, implicit in, in the other uh, information about a uh, marriage. And, and one thing is that it would leave her with multiple heads of the household, which would be an awkward thing to have, not something God would want. And it also wouldn't be clear who children were that she bore um, because if she had multiple husbands and that was very important in the Old Testament times. So um, a woman couldn't be in a multiple marriage uh, covenant or multiple marriage covenants like a man could be. But, but, but obviously it doesn't make any sense though because could a woman have a bunch of husbands, you know? And obviously she couldn't, so obviously there was... <laughs> The, the the rules or the laws that they were really thrown off of, of whack there, you know. That I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think that was very well thought out somehow, you know. Maybe God was kind of, you know, condescending to them in some ways, or maybe being very flexible. I, mean, I, I don't see how in the world that could be be justified at all, you know. The Mormons are doing it, of course, you know. Some of them, yeah. Uh, a lot, most of them have, have stopped doing that now, but there are some branches of Mormonism that do that. Well, God actually explicitly says there are times when you would have to have multiple marriages. Um, if uh, your brother's wife, um, uh, if he died, you would have to marry her to keep the family line going. Mm -hmm. And so multiple marriages would be, are commanded in places in the Bible. To preserve the name. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But on the other hand, in the very beginning, the the population was very small, and they, they wanted to be fruitful, multiply you know, as much as possible, I guess, you know. So it's a different time, you know, that yeah. no longer works. Were the con concubines? Concubines, yeah. A yeah. concubine was another kind of wife. wife. Yeah, they were a wife. They were, they were a wife with no... Um, no rights. No, well, <laughs> no, not quite no rights, but, but no um, uh, after-death yes. after death benefits. Um, so um, no... So the children could not inherit those. Yeah, no inheritance. That's the right word I'm looking for. Yeah. But they were still a wife um, in, in every other way. So really, yeah, so mm -hmm. like an incest because mm -hmm. the real wife is like up here, but the concubines are here along with their children. Mm -hmm. They don't inherit. They don't have any say. Yeah, yeah. Well, like like Sarah, she was always having odds with, at odds with a, with a handmaid, which I guess she became a, a concubine, yeah. right? Because she bore him a child. To so me, it seems like a concubine only existed to bear children. I mean, because if not, then why wouldn't she have just been the same status as the other wives? Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Right? Yeah, I don't know the answer on that. So, but she was allowed to get rid of her. So she could not have too much status if Sarah got rid of Hagar. Yeah. You know, that easily, you know, got away with that. So. Okay, so the point of bringing up multiple marriages is that it helps clarify something. Um, and the world uses um, the word cheating uh, to where we would use adultery, or at least I hope where we would use adultery. And so the world would say something like, he cheated on her. And, and that's not biblical. Um, you never see that idea presented in the Bible. And multiple marriages is one of the ways that you can see uh, how that doesn't make sense. So in a multiple marriage, if a man dates and marries another woman, how would that not be cheating? So if he's married one woman, 
he goes out and starts dating another woman, uh, marries her, you would think that that would be cheating, but obviously the Bible doesn't treat it that way. Um, and also if a, if a man who is married has a sexual relationship with a woman who is not his wife, um, which of his wives was cheated on? Well, that, <laughs> that's, that's a problem there. And so the, the Bible doesn't think of this idea of cheating on the spouse. It, it, it simply talks about adultery. And so a sexual relationship is uh, with someone who is not a spouse, and that is adultery, and, and, and that is um, the definition that the Bible uses. And it says, because there is no marriage covenant uh, to cover that sexual relationship, therefore it's adultery. So the adultery happens because of what the person has done that they didn't have a marital relationship or a with. Does that make sense? And, and so um, the adultery occurred because there wasn't a relationship that allowed um, there wasn't a covenant that allowed the marital, the extramarital, let me start over. <laughs> there wasn't a covenant uh, to cover um, that sexual relationship. I wrote it down well, but I didn't say it well. Okay, so, and, and so therefore it's, it's an offense against God. It's not an offense against the spouses. And, and so the idea of he cheated on her is that it's an offense on the spouse, but that's not the way God sees things. And, and so this is an offense against God's covenant, really. And, and so, um, and that includes imagined sexual relationships. Jesus talks about that too, is that it's not just um, physical uh, sexual relationships, but ones that are imagined. Okay, so civil marriage, um, we're almost done for today. I, I talked about that a little bit at the, the first, and, and this confuses people in, in the church as well. They, they often kind of conflate the two ideas of civil marriage and God marriage, but they're completely separate things. Uh, for a civil marriage, um, different entry terms are usually uh, available, especially now in our society. Uh, so a, a civil marriage may allow same gender marriages, uh, three or more people, animals, who knows what. And, and, and whatever society decides they, they want to allow, they will allow in their civil marriage. But that's not acceptable to God. Also, there are different benefits in a civil marriage. There are tax benefits and social programs and things that you can take advantage of when you're a married couple. And, and uh, usually you file your taxes based on your, your marital status. And, and a different exit. Um, a civil marriage uh, may allow divorce and remarriage in, in that when God doesn't do that. So civil marriage is, is something that society offers, but it isn't at all tied to the God marriage. And because of that, you can uh, wind up with uh, different situations for people, four different situations, really. One is that you're not civilly married and you're not God married. So you're just not married um, by anybody's definition. Um, you could be civilly married and God married, so you're married in both, uh, both uh, civil society and God recognize you as being married. You could be civilly married, but not God married, and that's what most of society is right now, is they, they may think that they are God married, but they're not, they're, and they're only civilly married. And you could also be not civilly married, but God married, and so that would be where you married someone, but you didn't get the civil license and all the rest of that process, that you didn't do that. This is where they use the term common law. Yeah. <laughs> married for 20 years. Congratulations. I know, uh, I know some people, a couple that got married in the church, but they never filed the papers in the court. Mm -hmm. So that when they didn't get along and they broke up, they said, well, we're not really divorced because we were never really married. <laughs> and they were, well, time out on that one because before you got, you were married. No, that doesn't count. Yeah, it counts even more, I think. What's it's wrong? the only thing that counts. Right. Thank you. What, okay, so what is the most, what should seeking married would make you think more about it than being a God married? I would think so. So, I mean, you would think that, like you said, government getting involved. So that's why you have to get a marriage license. Mm -hmm. and you have to apply for a marriage license, and then you have to have somebody sign the performance ceremony, sign it, and then... Ideally, you're supposed to have two witnesses. You don't have to be. You're supposed to have two witnesses. Mm -hmm. And then you have to file the marriage license. But, I mean, you are, in God's eyes, you're married. You could have, be married by a pastor or something and have what we were talking about a few slides before in the community's eyes, in the, in the mm -hmm. church's eyes. And that is the true marriage. And you would never apply for a marriage license. And you never have to follow it. You are definitely more married than if you just went and got a license and went to a judge. Mm -hmm. You're definitely more married than, than the other scenario. Yeah. And you can do that. 
And I guess as, as long as nobody ever challenges it, you can be okay. So you can live your life like that, which I don't think there's anything wrong if you did that, if you were mm-hmm. actually married in the eyes of God. Yep. You can live a long life together, um, um, pass away, and then, you know, mm-hmm. pass everything to this. But the problem is, if somebody tries to challenge that, it, it, it's bizarre, but then the, then the burden falls on the person who was married before the eyes of God but didn't follow a piece of paper to prove that they were actually married. And it's more than just, oh, that ceremony. I mean, then they have to show <laughs> steps A, B, and C. Mm-hmm. I mean, in order to in order in order to do that. So it's it's kind of backwards, but yeah. you're talking about government getting involved. And why does government usually get involved? Usually to get some money out of it in some way. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that, and that's a good point too. The, only, the the first marriage was God's marriage, and it wasn't until much later that men decided to create their own marriage and, and call it a marriage. But but it isn't the same thing. And and you're right also that um, it's almost essential in our society that if you get a God marriage, you also need to do the civil stuff because it, the government is so deeply involved in our lives now. Um, inheritance and all sorts of things like that come into uh, issues and. Our giving, even our, you know, ourselves, our status as a church, 501-3C, mm-hmm. they are involved, they have a, a hand in everything, a way to either get money from you, or control you, or both. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's all true. I wonder, uh, okay, so women usually change their name when they get married, but, you know, but so I, guess they, I guess they should, right, so the husband's last name, uh, most of the time, but do you have to, and I don't know this, do you have you change your, do you have to show a marriage license to change or you just change it on your driver's license and social security? I don't even know what documentation you have to show because I've never done it. Change it, change it for social, they give you a new social security. Yeah, but what do you have to show? Do you have to show them a marriage yes, license? Yes, a marriage well, see, I mean, so yeah. you would never be able to change your name if yeah. you just got married in the eyes of God. You would never be able to change your driver's license or your social security or anything. Yeah, but that's change, not fair. Yeah, that changing your name thing um, is really a cultural thing. Uh, it isn't uh, anything in the Bible about that, um, but uh, and um, and Melody kept her name. She's still Melody Smith, uh, and she's not um, Burton, although even her friends called her Burton and a bugs her. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, and that's because it's such a, a normal thing in our society to do is that the woman changes her last name when they get married. Well, that's but, just sort of like any, any kind of confusion, I guess, that could pop up. But yeah, yeah, I guess it doesn't matter one way or the other. But that makes sense, though that to happen because he's the head of that household the head of the family and isn't everything in the bible son of mm-hmm. david son of yeah yeah it's all the man it's all yeah you're holding my cats on my last name <laughs> 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 i believe that they're also in their characters <laughs> All right, moving on, moving on. The lobby and, and, the, and the director says, I'm ready to see Trudy Corrales now. Where is Trudy? <laughs> okay, last slide. Okay, more on civil divorce. Um, in the Old Testament, uh, there was a civil divorce. And what happened there was that at Moses' request, God had let him institute a civil divorce. And remember that saying, a man can uh, give a uh, written notice on a paper and, and re, uh, re- reject his wife. And uh, there were some laws about that. But it was still never acceptable to God. And we know that from what Jesus said. And and at at Jesus' time, they come up to him asking him, is it okay for a man to divorce for any reason at all? Or is it just for certain select reasons? And he says, no, never. It was was never uh, originally that way and and it isn't supposed to be that way. And so the verse that covers that is Matthew 19.8. Jesus said to them, Moses, confronting the callousness of your hearts, let you divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And so he's saying, Moses knew how callous your hearts were, how hard-hearted you were, uh, and and that you were just not going to be able to get along with your wives sometimes. And and so he let you divorce your wives. But it was not that way from the beginning. And uh, and he makes it clear, actually, maybe it should have been included with the next verse here. He goes on to say immediately that, that if you divorce, that's adultery. 
So uh, he said because some people were so hard that, that uh, they just couldn't uh, accept, uh, couldn't find a way to live with their, their wife that they'd married, that this was made possible probably for the benefit of the society. Because if two people, a marriage is wrecked, it, it affects all of their friends and their family and all those sorts of things. And, and so probably that's part of the reason why it was allowed. Allowed is the right word, allowed for them to do, but still not acceptable to God. It was still an intentional uh, sin. And that's what Jesus says about that. And he says that um, divorce and, and remarriage is simply not acceptable. In our society, um, we use the word divorce a little differently than the Bible does. Um, we, Whenever we say divorce, we think of that means you can go ahead and remarry somebody now. But the Bible doesn't treat it that way. It treats divorce a little bit more like a separation, but even that's not quite right. Uh, and, uh, and, and it, and it uh, puts you in a sinful state. We'll go any further on that. Any questions? No, I mean, that, that makes sense. I mean, everything we've been talking about, you know, marriage and, and divorce and stuff, that, that makes sense. And I think where it comes in is all, something that just popped into my brain a little. I just said, praise Jesus, because that's really when Jesus comes in also, when we're talking about marriage and divorce now. Mm -hmm. Because he's really... I think at this point, he, he tore the veil. He, he's that separation, right, between intentional and unintentional sin. And now we have that part of, okay, are the two people together now in union, whether they're civilly married, are they godly married, mm -hmm. right? Are their hearts in the right place? Are they a, a Jesus believer follower? And whether they were civilly divorced before, whatever, that's Jesus coming into your life or lives, mm -hmm. and then you uniting, that's the difference. Jesus is the difference now. Yeah. yeah uh, turning, turning to a godly life. Well, you know, I think next week we'll probably continue on with this topic and, and we'll get into the sort of things that Jesus said about that and Paul said about too. Um, but uh, he talks about the situation where you were both unbelievers uh, when you were married and, and now one of you is a believer and situations like that. And so we'll, we'll cover some of those next week, I think.